We are getting started with the Puppy Communications and Relationship live stream. This is going to be pretty casual for the most part. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'm going to take just a minute here to get set up and make sure everything is good and the sound is working as it's supposed to. So give me one sec. All right. This is officially my first YouTube live stream. I've had the YouTube channel up for quite some time, but have never actually done a live stream, at least not from here. So bear with me, might be a couple technical difficulties, but if anything goes awry, pop something in the chat and I'll try to get to it. Um, happy New Year to you as well. Thank you so much. Hopefully everyone's New Year has gotten off on the right paw, so to speak. <laughs> you know, the holidays are always crazy, so hopefully everyone got some rest and relaxation too. Uh, in case you are new to the channel, I am Sarah Andreco. I'm a certified dog behavior consultant. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do this live stream, especially right now, is because so many people are getting puppies this time of year, whether they're adopting from shelters, adding to the family during the holidays is a pretty big thing. So um, I wanted to kind of get ahead of things because prevention is one of my favorite things to talk about. As a behavior consultant, I work with a lot of really severe behavior cases. And so prevention is definitely one of my favorite things because a lot of a lot of different behaviors that we see, even the severe ones, can be prevented just based on some relationship building and um, communication. Obviously, that's some oversimplification to an extent. But um, today's topic is all about the importance of relationship building. Um, one of the things I like to always mention is when you get a new puppy, you're super excited about super excited about training. So putting in those really good skills like sit and down and stay and heal and all that fun stuff. And that is important. And you're going to bond with your puppy doing those things. But one of the most common things, mistake wise, that I see people make or new pet parents make is rolling into that super fast and expecting the puppy to kind of do all of these things when they haven't built that relationship first. And this is kind of like human relationships as well to where you build a relationship with someone before you have expectations of that person and puppies are no different. So I'm hoping today that I can provide a few different tips and tricks for you to help you build that relationship first, work on some communication skills. Um, but again, this is really super informal. So if you've got questions, I'm going to try to read them and answer them as they come. Um, but I will go over some, some information that I think is helpful for most of my puppy parents that I've worked with in the past. So first question, let's see, I adopted a dog who has definitely not been socialized and has already bit another dog. Okay. I take her on walks and she seems like she never has been on a walk advice. She's one. Yes. Lots. Um, a couple things here. I don't know how long ago you adopted the dog, but Make sure you got through that honeymoon period first, that first couple of weeks of getting to know you, getting the routine down. What are her likes, dislikes, fears? Um, is she giving off any stress signals that could indicate she's really uncomfortable in certain situations? And on the obedience side of things, really wait till you start building that relationship first. Get the routine down um, and then start focusing using some of her motivators, what she likes the most, whether it's food motivation, treats, affection, verbal praise, toys, whatever the case may be, to start building in some of that obedience at home. So when you mention walking on leash, I always start all of my leash walking skills in the house. So I'm going to start in the kitchen and in the living room and going up and down the stairs and teaching my dog where I want my dog to be or my puppy um, before venturing out on an actual walk. So the other kind of misconception here that might be at play, I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, a lot of people get a dog and they're like, I have to walk my dog. I have to walk my dog. Now, if you live in an apartment and you don't have a yard, yes, obviously you have to walk them to go potty and that sort of thing. But if you have the space or a yard or that sort of thing, don't feel like you have to get them out on a walk before you've got some leash skills onboarded to be able to provide enrichment, you know, things for them to smell and to see and to experience. There are a lot of other ways that you can provide that necessary exposure and enrichment um, that won't uh, jeopardize your, your training because the more that you're out and about and the more the dog stresses on a walk or pulls on a walk or has problems on a walk, the more they're practicing those problems. So take it a few steps back, work on that relationship building for the most part by really honing in on body language in different situations, work on your obedience skills at home first, and then try taking those skills that you're learning with your puppy or your dog 
um, out and about, branch out a little further, you know, into the driveway, down the sidewalk, pop them in the car and go to the park. But maybe just the first couple of times you go to the park, give your puppy or dog time to actually assimilate to everything that's around them before making a trip to the park and expecting them to get out and be able to focus. Um, the big thing, especially with puppies, is that they have fast minds and fast bodies. And so their attention span is pretty short. So when you get them out into a new place, even if it's, you know, just down the street from where you live, there's all these different things in the environment that are competing for attention. Uh, and often the first thing that they kind of, you know, blow off, but don't pay attention to is their person. Their person is safe. Their person is normal. And all there's all this other exciting stuff out there. So, um, and you said she's one, so she's a younger dog. So probably still kind of in that adolescent phase as well. So the other thing to keep in mind about that is that um, the adolescent adolescent phase is kind of tough as it is. Um, a lot of consistency is really important during that phase, uh, just so that they know um, that things are going to be the same and things are stable and things are secure. And all of that consistency, though it's difficult during that adolescent phase, will pay off big time in the long run once they get um, through that adolescence and they're they're fully mature. Anyhow, so hopefully that answers your questions. And thank you so much to Walking With Paws Dog Training. I really appreciate you sending people my videos. I got to get some newer ones up there. Um, also, if you ever have suggestions about things that you think would be helpful for your clients, um, particular topics or step-by-step -step instructions, let me know. I mean, I've got a list of things that I'm working on, but I'm always happy to put things out there that trainers in particular or other behavior consultants would find uh, valuable to, to share with clients. So, all right. So I think I got through that question. Um, okay. So one of the things that I wanted to mention too, my first piece of real solid advice in terms of relationship building, bond building is kind of um, ahead of the game. So if you know that you're going to get a puppy ahead of time, go ahead and reach out to an accredited dog trainer and either get into a group puppy class or get signed up for a private lessons. Um, one of the reasons I say that is because often dog trainers will book up months in advance um, and you want to make sure that when your puppy is ready to go, you're ready to go too. So you don't want to be waiting for months or you could miss a lot of learning opportunities and bonding opportunities with your puppy. And um, the other reason to that too is generally when you bring your puppy home, there's that first two week period. We call it the honeymoon period. Some puppies, it's a little longer, some it's a little less, but the the most important factor in that first couple of weeks with your puppy is not skills. It's not sit down, stay and all that. Yes, you're going to bond with your puppy doing those things again, but focus on those routines, um, working on teaching your puppy how to follow you. Puppies like a lot of movement. So in terms of being exciting and being fun for your puppy and rewarding your puppy for following you and paying attention to you. We're just working on really simple, small things to begin with. Um, Bonding is the other thing that I'll begin with right away in the first couple of weeks. Obviously, you're typically pretty smitten with your new puppies, but in terms of bonding, doing things that they really enjoy to spark more motivation to further engage with you. So lots of play. Play is a really, really powerful way to bond with your puppy. Um, play is tricky too. Some people tell me my puppy doesn't like to play or my dog doesn't like to play, um, especially like for the person who just adopted a dog that's one they may not really know what play is or haven't ever been in a situation where they can engage with another dog or another person in a, in a playful setting, especially like with a toy. So play can be taught and dogs can have a lot of fun learning how to play. But with puppies, um, some puppies like to tug. Some puppies that are more prey driven might like to bite into squeaky toys. Some puppies are more ball motivated and they're already off to try to run and grab and fetch the ball and bring it back for more. A lot of puppies are very treat motivated, which is why we use a lot of food to communicate different things, especially, yes, we like that, do that again when it comes to puppy training. So learning what their motivators are will help you bond with them because you can provide more of those things uh, to them. So in that initial period, you're, you're becoming really close with your puppy because you're doing things for them that they really enjoy and you're focusing on that relationship piece. Now, just as, as important as it is to be exciting and fun and for your puppy to really engage with you and follow you and use all of this movement, it's also a time where you can teach your puppy to relax with you. I say relax loosely. Obviously, puppies are very go, go, go a lot. But making sure that you have, you give them a bit of time and space for that too. So while you're keeping the excitement up and you're having lots of fun, 
during evening hours or evening periods after they've had some play, some exercise, maybe a little bit of brain stimulation with some puzzle toys or skill work, then you can focus on doing things that will teach your puppy also to kind of relax with you so they know that you're not just a source of excitement and fun. That's number one, but also learn how to kind of bring things down at the same time and learn that it's not just super high arousal, go, go, go all the time. So um, let me know if you have any questions about that in particular, but teaching those two things is important. Now, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm going to read this comment quick just to see. been walking her, and the screen is far from me. So if I look like an old lady squinting, it's just because my screen's at a distance. So I apologize. Uh, I've been walking for about two and a half. Um, okay. Two and a half. She went from pulling to walking by my side. I use a slip leash. I want her to socialize with other dogs, but I was told she bit another dog. So I have no idea how to, okay. Even start to introduce her to other dogs. I don't know what signs to look for if she will like another dog or will attack. Um, okay. So most dogs out there are dog selective. You know, puppies are a bit of an exception because they're still learning the world. They haven't fully matured and they're still trying to figure things out. What do I like? What do I not like? It's like the experimental phase. The more you get into that maturity period, the more dogs are starting to become more genetically set in what they do like, what they don't like from a genetic perspective. But then also those experiences with genetics kind of culminate to say, what is a dog's personality going to really look like? And the majority of dogs out there are dog selective, meaning that they don't get along with everyone and they don't hate everyone. <laughs> so they're not going to be aggressive to all dogs and they're not going to be, or animals or people, and they're not going to be super friendly and happy go lucky with everyone that they meet. It's kind of like people, you know, we just don't click with everyone that we meet. Um, there's kind of a spectrum and dogs are very similar there. So Especially being a new dog, I would take things very, very slow. I would not rush into wanting to introduce your dog to other dogs. What I would do is work on you and the focus with your dog on you first, because if things go awry or say something seems like it's going okay and it's not, you need to be able to pull your dog's focus back to you and pull your dog out of a situation easily. And that's going to be that bonding and that obedience part to start with. So um, start there. Uh, work on walking by other animals and not interacting with anyone. It's okay to look and smell and watch and observe and um, reinforce or reward your, your dog for watching and smelling and sniffing and observing. But Give your dog time to actually know that other animals and other situations are safe. Really put some emphasis on that. I, I, I focus on that for at least a few months before even thinking about um, sending my dog, even a dog that I think is very dog friendly to interact with others. I want to focus on myself as the handler and that dog and our focus together and our relationship together first. And then when I do do introductions to kind of test the waters and see how things are going, I like to take it slow with that too. So if it's a dog that I'm walking by that I may never see again, and I'm not going to build a formal relationship with, I'm not going to let my dogs meet that dog, period. Um, just too many things can go wrong. Dog owners can misread their dog's social cues and put you in a predicament that you don't want to be in. Um, so if it's not a dog that I want my dog to develop a long lasting relationship with, I just don't let them interact, period. It's just not worth the risk or the trauma, especially during this kind of spongy um, period of their life, so to speak. So uh, for dogs that I want them to possibly develop a relationship with, or I'm more interested to see if they're actually going to get along with another dog, family member, friend, neighbor, whatever the case may be, uh, I'm going to let those dogs spend a lot of time in each other's presence before there's any physical interactions. So it's kind of like um, the analogy I use a lot is you, you go out on a date with someone and um, you've got people out there that are just looking to hook up and you've got people out there that really want to get to know you and know your personality and they're looking for a relationship. When it comes to dogs and keeping them comfortable in their interactions, focus on the getting to know you and the relationship piece first. Uh, so with that being said, what I'll do is um, active walking where we're parallel walking with the dogs. So there's two bodies in between each dog on either side, and we spend some time walking with each other. And then the next time we might spend some time walking and then having some downtime where they can just relax in each other's company, like either via a place queue or on their bed, but they are not physically interacting. And this gives them the opportunity to learn um, the other animal that's in the room without having to have that up close personal experience where their boundaries can really get um, screwy or overstepped and they can get very offended when otherwise they might be perfectly fine with this other animal with the proper introduction. 
So I like them to get to know each other by smell, by sound, to observe the other animal with movements. Um, and then the other consideration I take into factor is, are there any signs of any type of resource guarding? So any food aggression, any possessive aggression, any signs of anything like that, because that is going to uh, potentially alter how a relationship is going to go, whether it's going to go well or it's going to go sour based on kind of some of those initial interactions. So I want to make sure that I really know my dog very well and what I'm dealing with in all aspects before putting them in a situation that I might not be prepared for or they might not be prepared for. So hopefully that makes sense. But lots of interactions where there's not physical interactions. It's just about the exposure so they can learn the other animal through their strongest senses, you know, smell and hearing and giving them the opportunity to observe. When I do start letting them have physical interactions, if I don't see any red flags and I think things are going well, um, often I'll have a, um, this you have to be careful with too, but I'll have a barrier like a baby gate or a fence and I'll have short spurts of letting them kind of sniff and go away. Um, Cause the other thing about knowing your dog too is are there any barrier issues? Does barrier a barrier like a fence cause frustration? Is there any leash reactivity or anything like that? So if I'm feeling good, everything looks looking great, there's no red flags, no snarling, no stiffening. A lot of this is about reading body language. Um, you know, are the ears pinned back? Are we hypervigilant? Are we growling? Are we, are we holding our breath? Are we tense? Are the hackles up? If things like that are happening, I'm going to give my dog a little bit more space to get more accustomed. But say we don't see any of that. We're excited. I've got a loose body wag. My body language says I'm happy. I'm kind of really interested and curious. Uh, the first couple times that I do play sessions or interactions, it's quick. It's 60 seconds. Next time it might be five minutes and then so on and so forth. So that slow introduction is really something that can help your puppy or your dog along the way, not only be more comfortable meeting new other animals, because especially with adoptions, you don't know what the history is so far, um, but also get comfortable faster integrating with new animals that they actually are interested in. Now, the last thing I want to say about this too, and then I'll move on kind of to the next topic is, um, it's okay if your dog doesn't want to be social, keep that in mind as well. So you may kind of want this dog that's going to get along with everyone and be friendly with everyone and have a grand old time. And that's a beautiful thought it is, but not all dogs are like that. In fact, a lot of dogs aren't. So play it by ear. And the more that you give in to your dog's individual personality in terms of what they like and what they don't, and you don't force them into situations they don't want to be in, the more likely they are to have good positive experiences that you can piggyback off of to get more towards your goal of having a more social animal. But it's important to build a more socially appropriate animal than a, a social butterfly, if that makes sense, because a lot of dogs just don't want to be that social butterfly. All right, so let's see what else we've got. Um, my new puppy puts her teeth bites on me and all my family members. Is that normal? Sorry, there's a heart in the way. Um, how long does that last? Okay. Really good question. So puppies bite, like they like to bite things. And there's a number of different reasons for that. One, they're teething and their puppy teething typically up through about six months of age. Some smaller breeds will retain their puppy teeth a little bit longer, but for the most part, use six months to, as a, as a kind of a guideline in terms of how long it's going to take for those puppy teeth to fall out and the adult teeth to fully emerge and come in. So while they're teething, they want to bite things because it feels good and it's soothing. Uh, biting is also soothing in terms of coping. So it helps alleviate stress. And with puppies, they're exploring and experiencing everything. And that includes putting lots of things in their mouth because it feels good or they want to figure it out or they want to taste it or whatever the case may be. Uh, they have lots of different motivators for that. But in terms of dealing with puppy biting, because yeah, ouch, that can really be difficult. Um, it's a lot of redirection. So it's a lot of teaching your puppy what is okay to bite. It's not stopping the biting. Puppies want to bite. So what you want to do is give them appropriate things to bite. Have lots of toys stashed around the house that you can grab and you can immediately re redirect to communicate to your puppy, yes, do this, bite this, have at it. Um, and in terms of communication with your puppy as well, when they are biting on you, stop the game, stop the fun, but then immediately go and grab the toy or the chew thing that they can chew on. With puppies, you know, you want to make it kind of boring and not as fun when they're doing the things that you don't really want, but immediately give them something to redirect that energy and that behavior, because we're not going to stop the biting. We're going to redirect the biting onto something that's appropriate. 
Um, this is one of the reasons that I highly recommend tethering your puppy to yourself or always having them supervised pretty much 24 seven if they're not sleeping in the crate or just right in front of you because they can practice the habit of biting a lot of things that you don't want them biting. And the more they bite those things, the harder it is to kind of break those habits after that teething period because after that kind of six month um, puppy teething period, a lot of what happens after that is kind of leftover or habit. Not always. Some some puppies have a longer span of um, chewing and things like that. But for the most part, a lot of it is just leftover habit. So if puppy biting, um, really control that in terms of being able to reach like small children by using leashes or tethers or people with thin skin, but lots of redirection for what they can do and get them really, really excited about those things that you want them to bite. Um, the other thing that I do to help with this too is I kind of differentiate my toys uh, so they know what's acceptable to bite and to chew on and what is not. So for example, um, I will, uh, if I buy a toy from the pet store and I'm going to give it to them, but they grab it and they, you know, or they're already playing with it. I'm going to trade them for it. I'm going to put it away and I'm going to give it back to them at some other point. Um, if I'm wanting to differentiate what they can have and what they can't have, I need lots of supervision for that, but I also need to be there in the moment to be able to prevent them actually reaching the thing and redirecting with a new toy, so to speak. So hopefully that helps with the the puppy biting question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for telling me I'm knowledgeable. I appreciate that. This is obviously a huge passion of mine to learn as much as I can. Uh, this helps me immensely. Good. I am so glad. Please feel free to follow up with me. Ask any other questions that you might have. Let me know how things are going. I always love to hear, especially after giving some feedback. I know it's kind of in a general setting, but how things are working, because if something isn't working, there are always other things that we can adapt with and use. So, all right. Oh, walking with paws. Yes. Um, they really are like people in so many ways. It's funny. We focus on like not anthropomorphizing because that can be dangerous too, to treat them like, you know, humans to where they're going to do human things. But the similarities especially the similarities in, t in terms of like learning and sensitivity is so um, interestingly parallel to like kids and humans. So yeah, you're, you're correct. Um, and some are more wallflowers and that's okay. Yes, that is so true. I'm a true introvert, right? Uh, me, that is, I know it doesn't seem like it, but yeah, some of them really just want to sit back and watch and they love to do that. I've met um, a number of pet parents that have said, you know, my dog loves going to the dog park, but wants nothing to do with the other dogs or people. Like we want to be on the outside or he wants to play with his ball, whatever the case may be, or we go to the park and he sits there and watches all the kids and like chews on his bone. But if a kid comes over, he wants nothing to do with it and growls. You're right. Like some of them really just enjoy watching what's going on and that's their jam and that's totally fine. And that is that's a big piece. We're talking about relationships and communication here. And so when your puppy is giving you these communications, your dog is giving you these communi communications that I'm good with this. I'm not great with that. I'm good with this. I'm not great with that. The more we listen, the more that builds our bond and the more our dogs trust us. Uh, when we say, okay, I hear you, or I see you, I'm not going to push you into that, or I'm not going to make you do something that you don't want to do. I'm going to focus on the things that you enjoy especially the things that we enjoy doing together, that that speaks volumes to your puppy. That's huge. So um, I love that you brought that up. That's perfect. Um, and speaking of bonding, I mentioned play. Um, and obviously when you start training, you're going to bond more and more with your puppy, but body language plays a huge part in communication and being able to bond the way you want to bond. So remember, you got to look at the individual in front of you. Now, there's all these normalcies, right, with puppies. We have, you know, German Shepherd puppies like to bite things and they're mouthy. And we have our Golden Retriever puppies that like to fetch and, you know, that are, you know, all around typically happy-go-lucky puppies. But so you can make some breed generalities about what different dog groups like to do based on how we've bred them for those jobs, so to speak. But if you look past the individual and you're always focused on, well, golden retrievers like this and Beaucerons like this and American Bubble Terriers like this, it removes the individual from the equation and you miss out on a lot of those bonding opportunities from not being able to see the, the very specific things that those dogs like. To give you some examples, um, I'll use American Pitbull Terriers because they're one of my favorite dogs. Uh, a lot of them are, you know, they're, oh, you know, they're going to be dog aggressive or they're going to be super dog selective or they they have such a high prey drive that they're going to kill small animals. Well, there are plenty of American Pitbull Terriers out there that get along just fine with cats or birds. 
and some that will kill cats or birds. But it's on an individual level. Um, when it comes to genetics and breeding, we can select for specific things as much as we can, and we can create a higher probability that those things are going to occur, but that's not always the case. So when you're dealing with your puppy, it helps to know specific things about the breed you're looking at getting or the breed mix, so to speak, and their personalities, especially if you're adopting, really listening to a foster parent or the shelter about what kind of personalities they have. But ultimately, what's going to help you the most in forming that bond and that relationship is when you get that dog home or you get that puppy home, learning their motivators, their likes, their dislikes, their stressors, um, and really learning how to read that body language. There is... Um, I'm going to put this in my new, I just, by the way, I just launched a short course on this very topic today, a puppy course. So I'll figure out how to put the link somewhere in here to share it with you guys, but it's on my canine community on circle and it's called puppy communications and relationship building. So it's basically this, but goes much more into depth. Um, but it's not overly complicated about how to relationship build and how to effectively communicate. There are exercises and all sorts of things. So I'll try to figure out how to get that information out to you guys. So you can see that, but I went down a rabbit hole now. I forgot what I was telling you about that because there's something that I put in that course that I was going to share on that topic. Now I forgot what it was because it's late and I'm tired, but that's okay. We're going to move on. Uh, let me think here. What haven't I gone over just yet? Oh, we were talking about body language. I was going to give you a recommendation. <laughs> so one of the best tools that I found is a really, really simple tool for learning body language and communication from tails to ears to positions. Uh, and I did write an article at Native Pet um, on their blog about body language recently, but there's a book by Lily Chin and it's called Dog Body Language, I wanna say. Um, great book to share with kids because it's mostly illustrations that show you positions of heads and tails and bodies. Now, everything is in context, don't forget that. Every type of thing that you're looking at, whether it's a wagging tail or a stare is all about context as well. But the book breaks it down so simply that it's very easy to kind of see the differences, the, the very subtle differences sometimes in different body postures and what the tail is doing and what the ears are doing and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think it's like nine or $10 on Amazon and no, no affiliate. I don't make any money. I just love her book. It's great. Um, but it's dog body language. It's by Lily Chan. And, um, it's one of the best representations I've seen. It reminds me of, um, Dr. Sophia Yin's posters and illustrations that she used to do late great Dr. Sophia Yin on, um, different body language signals, uh, from dogs and how to greet dogs appropriately and what their body language looks like when they're comfortable or when they're not comfortable. So that's always a really good, um, resource as well. Uh, I'd share a video of working with handling skills with her puppy. She said everything was great, but her puppy was so bitey. Yes. I saw a lot of the puppy saying, please stop. Okay. Yes. Um, I give that book to everyone. That's so good. That is one of my favorite things to immediately put on the right away list. Like, especially if people have kids, cause it's easy for kids to follow. So um, you bring up a point about please stop. And this is a signal there are a lot of signals that say, please stop, that I think really get missed. So when you're learning about puppy communication and dog communication and building relationships based on that communication, knowing those stop signals is, is super important too. I love that you pointed this out. This wasn't even on my list to talk about. So thank you for that. A um, couple of different things to look for. Um, one of them, and these can mean different things. Remember, this is about context. One is the please paw. If you ever see a dog that just puts up the one paw, um, sometimes it's please, can I have that treat that's in your hand? Or please, can I have access to that? Or can I go out the back door? But sometimes it's also, oh, please don't do that. Oh, please stop. So, you know, I call it the please paw. There's, there might be another name for that particular movement as well, but I notice it in dogs that are not only asking like, Hey, can I have that? And they're waiting patiently for it. So I think saying please, but also when a dog is displaying other stress signals that they're uncomfortable, I'll notice that little paw lift up too. So that's one of them. Um, uh, one of the other things you'll notice too is, um, giving you lots of different behaviors aside from the one that you're asking for. So I've got a video of my dog doing this. I was taking a, um, service dog coach class at one point. And uh, one of the exercises was to teach retrieve. And my dog hates holding things in her mouth. And I was like, oh, this is not going to go well. How am I going to do this without her hating life? Um, I am much more of a worker than my dog is, uh, which is why I got a boaster on. But um, And she's giving me a run for my money. But in this exercise that I was doing with her, it, we really started to connect and we really started to click. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be able to teach my dog how to retrieve an item without her like being upset about it and her actually wanting to engage and wanting to do it. 
Well, I got a little um, cocky, I'll say, with it and pushed her too hard. And I was recording because we had to re record for this session. And um, you can see her like rolling over and playing dead. You can see her like going in a down and you can see her doing all of the things except for what I'm asking. And that is another clear sign that your dog or your puppy is saying, oh, I've had enough of this, please stop. Um, so when they offer you all the different behaviors, except for the one that you're trying to work on, that's a good indication that they are done with that. Can we please move on? So definitely move on. All right. Uh, I plan on making a little bed for my pup so that she can sleep right next to me. Great. Almost like a bassinet. <laughs> Cute. Does this help a dog feel more affection or is this not a good idea? I love this idea. Um, I think dogs are much more comfortable when they're around us and they're with us. And I see absolutely no problem with your dog sleeping close with you. Uh, I also am not in the camp of, oh, you can't let your dog sleep in the bed. You want your dog to sleep in the bed or your dog sleep in the bed. Um, if you're having problems like possessiveness or guarding or something like that, that's different. You need to reach out to a behavior professional, certified dog behavior consultant or veterinary behaviorist. Uh, to work through the root cause of why those possessive behaviors are happening. But outside of that, let the dog sleep wherever it's most comfortable for all of you involved. Um, I like having my dogs in the same room with me. Some people that have allergies, you know, if there are kids in the house that have allergies, you know, they obviously try to have the dog sleep not in that same room. And I get that. But um, I find through my experience that most dogs, especially new dogs and new puppies, um, are much more comfortable and assimilate much more faster Uh and feel more safe and secure when they're actually in the same room as the, um, as the family, as at least a family member, often their person. Um, I don't know how many of you have noticed this, but when you have a multiple household family, dogs tend to gravitate like towards a person, even if they love everyone and everyone's equally involved, they do play favorites sometimes. So sleeping in the same room is the favorite. Um, yeah, totally fine. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you guys are finding some value in this information. I really hope that it helps for sure. I'm also hoping that YouTube is recording this so I can share it with other people that asked about it that aren't here tonight. We'll see being my first time around, but thank you for that. Uh, so I did want to mention one quick thing about timing and timing in terms of communication, because timing is super, super important. And actually this makes me think of Sophia Yin again, because she used to have us do these exercises where she'd say, go, go. And you'd have to get your treat to the chair really, really fast because she wanted you to improve how fast you could deliver a treat to a dog. Now, mind you, coming in a dog like that with a treat, you know, would kind of startle them. But her point was, is that your timing really, really matters in terms of communicating exactly what you're trying to say to your dog. So um, in terms of timing and how this can cause some miscommunication is um, if your treat isn't delivered or your toy doesn't come out for a tug at the exact moment that the behavior is being exhibited that you want to see repeated, you've missed your opportunity. So for example, if you're teaching your puppy sit and you lure your treat up over their head and they pop their little butt down and you're like, yes, good dog. And then you go to give that treat and their butt pops up, that opportunity is gone. So distract them, call them out, reset, and make it a point to get that treat to them before they even have the opportunity to lift that little butt up. Because if you're rewarding them after they already stand up, then what you're actually telling them is I want you to sit and then I want you to get up and then you get the treat and we're done with that. So that can be really tricky in terms of communication. So make sure that your timing is on point. And, and with puppies in particular, they are much faster than we are. <laughs> so they move quicker. Their attention spans are much shorter. So you really got to practice kind of being as quick as you can in terms of getting that treat to them. Um, the other thing that I want to mention in terms of using treats and timing is that I use luring a lot. And luring, all that means is the puppy sees that you have a treat and you're going to use it to get them into a particular position. And then you're going to turn that lure into a reward for following that and being in that position. Super helpful when you're trying to teach things that are very specific, especially like heel, right? Like landing in the heel position or remaining in the heel position as you're moving for the first few times that you do that. It's really, really helpful. Um, but I do see puppy parents run into problems when the puppy starts associating the treat as part of the thing. So if the treat isn't there, they don't do the thing because, hey, we're missing a piece of that, that 
package. So the puppy ends up working only when there's food present or the dog does, um, but they don't actually do the things because uh, they don't have a full understanding when the treat's not present. So when you're luring, what you want to do is fade that out as quickly as you can because your communication is really about the action, not the luring. You're just using that to kind of link behaviors. So when you're thinking about how to progress that, I typically go from luring them into position several times, letting go of that treat, and then I'll use my finger that still smells like that treat, do the same thing. Yes, immediately deliver that treat from the other hand if needed. Um, the timing on that's really important too, because they can be on to the next thing. Um, they can be looking at your hand as you're going to get the treat and then they're following you to that. So I'll use my hand a couple times, then you lessen the hand gestures, and then you can slow down how quickly you deliver that treat. So basically you start off luring, but you want to get rid of that in your finger as quickly as you possibly can to kind of help with that. All right. Uh, I wish I could stay all night. Me too. And I could talk to you all night, but I won't. <laughs> You got to get going. No problem. Thanks so much for stopping by. I hope that information was was helpful. And um, thank you for adopting, especially for bringing a dog that's not a puppy into your home. It's tough for the adult dogs out there. But the fun thing about an adult is that you oftentimes know what you're getting based on the age. Um, and puppies are super shapeable and moldable. But a lot of it has to do with um, how they're brought up with their parents and where they came from and what happens before you even get them to. So okie dokie. Uh, any more questions in terms of communication, bond building. Uh, like I said, I do have a short course on this that goes considerably more in depth. So that can really help if anyone has more questions or might be struggling with anything in terms of bonding with their puppy. Um, I will figure out again how to put that. I might be able to copy a link and put it in here for you. Uh, it'll be on my website as well. Um, let me see, just in case there's anything else I haven't gone over before I pop off and I'll wait for any other questions that might come up. Uh, yeah, so what I forgot to mention about luring too, and you'll see this in a lot of my videos, especially a lot of my practice videos, is that I don't actually use the words for the cue. Cue, command, um, same thing for the most part. Uh, with words and teaching dogs words, I will lure them, teach them the position. Um, so we can use sit as another example. I want to actually use the word sit because when you're talking and you're moving and you've got all these things going on and the puppy's trying to learn, there's a lot to figure out. So one of the first things that you can pull out of the equation that's easiest is your voice with the exception of encouragement because they don't understand the words that are coming out of your mouth anyway. What you want to do is start associating an action or a movement that you've built in with a word. But if you teach the behavior first and then you pair it with a word, I find in my experience, the puppies pick up on it a whole lot faster. So for example, with sit, so say I'm going to use my little lure and I'm going to pull it up over their heads so the little bottom pops down. Yes. And I'm going to give that treat. So I might give a yes marker or something like that, but that's what I'm going to do. Then I move from that lure and I use my finger to get that sit. Yes. And then I bring my reward and I give it to my, to my puppy. Once my puppy knows what I'm looking for, just with that hand movement to start and that bottom goes down, like, got it, mom. I know exactly what to do to get my reward then I will start naming it. So it's several sessions in before I actually start using the word sit. And what I'll do is I'll replace that yes. Instead um, of using that marker, I'll use my sit because I'm going to use that same excitement with that with my tone anyway. So as I pull my hand up and my puppy sits, I'll say sit and then I'll grab my treat and my reward and I'll give it to my puppy. So um, that's one of the things that I, I find helps a lot when you're trying to communicate all these different things that you want with your puppy and train them to do different things is remove your voice from the equation, practice without using any words. And then once your puppy has an idea of what's going on, then start pairing the word that you want to use um, with that, uh, that, that action, that motion. Uh, request is what I use. I like that. I like that. I, I like that we're getting away from the word command. It's very authoritating and dominating. And if we look at our relationship with our dogs as they are subordinates and they're going to do what we say, it, it can really break down our ability to truly bond um, with our puppies and provide a safe and secure space for them. Um, and something that's been studied, and I won't get into it for a long time, is um, animals in the wild, wild dogs, wild wolves, um, things like that. And they find that they operate more as a family unit um, with family guidelines. And I find that in relationships with puppies and dogs, that treating them as such um, can really open up a lot of doors that at least I find in my history of raising and training dogs were not open before when I didn't see it that way because I wasn't raised that way. 
So I did things a lot differently prior. And now looking at my animals, my dogs as a part of my family and we're a family unit and this is a cooperative unit. Yes, there are rules and guidelines, but um, to me, I find that the relationships, uh, I bond faster. Um, I find that my pet parents are bonding so much faster and that the goals that they have, they're reaching them much faster. It makes a considerable difference to have that mind shift. So I like the request. I like you uh, because it really is about about a partnership. It's about a relationship um, and you're hoping it'll be a really strong, healthy relationship. So uh, I like that we're getting away from kind of that that term command. So. All right. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. I'm happy to share. Uh, I really hope this helps. I know so many people have puppies right now. I have an eight month old puppy too, and she's a working breed and I was ready. I was prepared, but now I have her and I have a different feeling about that. So <laughs> even when you do this for a living, um, puppies can still slap you in the face. <laughs> so good luck out there to everyone that has a puppy that's raising a puppy right now. Check out my communications and relationship course. If you need some help, get a dog trainer on board. That is a positive reinforcement based accredited credential dog trainer. You can look at CCPDT, IABC. There's a bunch of different organizations out there, but get somebody on board early to help you right away. You'd be amazed what a professional can point out or add to that can really speed the process up for you. So um, check it out. If you have any questions, my email is sarah at the whole dog dot life. Sarah at the whole dog dot life. You can find me on all the socials, of course, YouTube here. And um, yeah, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. So also not super responsive because I get a lot of messages. So give me time. I will get up with you. Um, but thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you found some value in this. And uh, I'll do another one sometime soon, I'm sure. Take care. Happy New Year's.